Hello, everyone. Thank you for your extreme patience while we were getting ready. We have a new sound system, and we haven't figured it all out, but thank you. My name is Penny Wright. We're so delighted to have all of you here today to uh, for a visit with two of our famous, uh, famous and favorite uh, authors and our favorite editor. Um, <laughs> I just want to mention that the library has lots of programs. Many of you live in our library district. Some of you do not. And for those of you who live outside of our district, we hope you'll take a newsletter home with you and join us for many of our programs. And if you join the Friends of the Library for whatever amount you want to pay, and this is unusual, um, you, you'll get our newsletter in the mail every two months. So that's a real perk. So. With us today, we had invited uh, Tom and Phil, and then the idea was hatched, and we thought it was a really good one, to have Joe Shaw here as the sort of moderator, and so here is Joe. I'll tell you a couple of things about Joe. Uh, as many of you know, he's the executive editor of the Express News Group, which is the newly formed company that owns the three editions of the Southampton and East Hampton Press and the Sag Harbor Express. Both the Press and the Express have been recognized as among New York State's and the nation's best community newspapers. And the two papers have won hundreds of state awards for news commentary, photography design, and detail, present, the digital presentation. Joe is from Pittsburgh, a city he talks about <laughs> lovingly. <laughs> I am told to the, point of, to the point of annoyance. I wrote that. You did. It's just true. <laughs> but he's been at the press for 21 years and is, this is a really interesting fact, he's only the eighth editor since that newspaper began 122 years ago. So please welcome Joe Shaw. <laughs> to Joe's left and your right is Tom Clavin who was a reporter for 15 years for the New York Times and served as editor of weekly newspapers for 12 years before turning to writing full time, a move we, we are very happy about. Four of his books have been New York Times bestsellers, Dodge City, The Heart of Everything That Is, Halsey's Typhoon, and The Last Stand of Fox Company. Other recent titles that have received popular and critical acclaim include The DiMaggio's, Lucky 66, Last Men Out, Reckless, and Valley Forge. Wild Bill was published by St. Martin's Press in February of this year, and this November, Harper Collins, which is this month actually, will release, and has just released, All Blood Runs Red, uh, which by the way is available at a huge discount for those of you who may, may want to buy the very few copies that we have here. Um, we even beat Amazon. Oh, <laughs> by, a, by a big amount, so free delivery. if you want to buy, buy now. Awards have been received from the Society of Professional Journalists, National Newspaper Association, and the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation. Tom has a website you can visit to learn more if you like. Please welcome Tom Clavin. Another guest who is known probably to many of you is Phil Keith, who holds a degree in history from Harvard. <coughs> After his graduation, Phil went into the Navy and served in Vietnam. He was awarded two Air Medals, the Purple Heart, the Presidential Unit Citation, two Navy Commendation Medals, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. Phil has authored three novels and six nonfiction books. Black Horse Riders won an award for Best Military Nonfiction Book and was a finalist for the 2013 Colby Award and earned a 2013 Silver Medal from the Military Writers Society of America. Stay the Rising Sun, an account of the crucial World War II Battle of the Coral Sea and the loss of the aircraft carrier USS Lexington, won the 2015 Admiral Samuel Morrison Prize for Naval Literature. All Blood Runs Red, which is, as you know, a biography of Eugene Bullard, is co-written with his partner Tom Clavin 
and we are delighted to have Phil Keith with us as well. Please welcome Phil Keith. Hey, you're not here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Books are for sale. Yeah. Thank you, Penny. I have to say, when Penny said, hey, would you like to come over and interview Phil and Tom? I said, the Everly Brothers, absolutely. <laughs> I'm there. So. Phil Keith and uh, Tom Clavin are both uh, good friends of mine and former and current uh, columnists for the press. And so I have had uh, the pleasure of reading their writing separately for a very, very long time. Um, and it's a lot of fun to see this work sort of come together. I, my first question I hesitate to ask, and Phil and I were talking about this because it's a little, a little self-serving, but I want to ask where the germ of this came from, but it's only because it's such a great story uh, that you were, you were just, uh, we were reliving there for a moment, so yeah. Tell, tell me, because it's, his, his life almost seems impossible, and I'm curious where you came across Eugene Bullard and why you chose him for the topic of the book. Well, sometimes the stars align, and of course, if you're a writer, you're always looking for good stories and good ideas. And I was researching a book on uh, World War I, and in that book I was writing a chapter on famous American uh, pilots who had participated in the First World War, and of course, uh, you could probably name half a dozen of them, you know, the Eddie Brickenbachers of, of the world. <clears throat> and down buried in a footnote in the Rickenbacker material that I was reading was this mention of, oh yes, there was a fellow by the name of Eugene Ballard who was the first African-American fighter pilot. And I said, who is this? I've never heard of this guy. And I, I swear to you, it wasn't maybe two days later, I get an email from Joe, and someone has sent to him a little clipping that he had gotten somewhere, and it was about Gene Ballard. And Joe sent me a copy of the email, and he said, I would love to read a book about this guy. Well, so there you go. <laughs> but it's amazing, because as I said, I send a hundred of those emails a day to people. Yeah. They generally don't turn into best-selling books, so uh, <laughs> it was kind of fun to see that happen. But you mentioned Bullard. He's not a well-known figure in any way, shape, or form. How is that possible? Well, there are a couple of reasons, and uh, Tom can pitch in here too, but I think that the first important reason is that, uh, and we'll get into this more, uh, I'm sure, the level of detail, but the first important reason is that when he flew and became first famous, or actually second famous in his life, as, as an aviator, he flew for France in World War I. And unfortunately, because of the color of his skin, he was not wanted by the American Air Service. And as soon as the Americans got into it in 1917, <clears throat> Gene and about 25 of his other friends who were also pilots raced off to Paris to sign up for the American Air Service. They all took to physical, they all passed, and they were all commissioned as first or, uh, or second lieutenants in the American Air Service except for, guess who? It was official policy in 1917, uh, this seemed unbelievable to me, but it was official policy, written policy in 1917 in the American Air Service that blacks were incapable of flying an aircraft. They couldn't even be mechanics because they were thought not to be able to understand how engines are put together. So when, when Ballard flew, and of course we will talk more about this, and uh, performed the deeds that he did, uh, they were for France, and none of that information got back to America. And even though the French were much more uh, racially sensitive than the Georgians that uh, Jean had been born and raised with, there were still, there were still prejudices. And there was one particular fellow, you'll, you'll read about him in the book, his name was Dr. Edmund Grow, G-R-O-S. And he actually was the founder of the American Hospital in Paris. He, he was an American. 
but moved to France and founded the American Hospital. He also founded the American Ambulance Corps. If you remember <clears throat> in the beginning of uh, World War I, there was an ambulance corps populated by a number of Americans who wanted to simply help out, one of whom was Ernest Hemingway, and you may know that story. <clears throat> but Groh was particularly racist, and he was responsible for the formation of the Lafayette Escadrille, American pilots, excluded Gene from that. There was a fund that Americans who were living in France raised to pay American pilots extra money for flying in World War I. And they all got paid on a monthly basis. Gene was always the last to get his check. And it was always for less than the other guys. So that's part of the story. I have a feeling the fact that he was an aviator was a particular appeal for you. You were an aviator oh, yeah. as well, right? And I yeah. have a feeling that. Tom, um, you've written several books, many books, and you've written with uh, Bob Drury has been your writing partner. This is your first book writing with Phil. Right. You've written about really famous people, Joe, Joe DiMaggio. Um, you've written about people like Red Cloud who were important in history but maybe not as well known. Yeah. What is it about Eugene Ballard that stood out to you uh, and made him worthy of, of tackling in a book? Well, I think from the beginning, uh, in some of the discussions Phil and I were having, uh, that uh, uh, I saw, I saw, you know, it's funny, in the South it's Bullard. Like north of the Mason Dixon line, it's Bullard. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get getting used to Bullard. Um, anyway, uh, I really saw him as like a Forrest Gump, uh, a, a black Forrest Gump with a much higher IQ. Uh, because he lived so many different lives. He went from one thing into another. So that was part of it. Somebody who, who in one life seemed to have five, six, seven lives. Uh, the other thing that appealed to me is that uh, he, was a char he was somebody who never seemed to say, no, I can't do this. Uh, his, 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 the reservoir of resiliency that he had was just enormous, I mean, very deep. So that, uh, I mean, first of all, physical resiliency, what some of the things he had to put up with, including su suffering several very serious wounds, uh, a, a couple of them during combat, and once when he was uh, a, a spy for the French resistance. And, uh, but there were obviously the racial challenges and barriers he had to face. And, and so he, uh, I really admire, came to admire this person as, as the, the poster boy for resiliency and courage. And, and, and I think inevitably an appeal was that he was such an obscure figure as far as America was concerned. How is it possible that we had this such a remarkable person and yet knew nothing about him? So that, you know, for somebody who's a writer, that's, that's gold. Because it's one thing, I mean, how many biographies can you do of Lincoln? <laughs> you know, there's nothing left to say that hasn't been uncovered by this point. But to write a book about somebody who's, who's to be, yet to be discovered is really exciting. Let's talk a little bit about the book and about his story. Uh, what really struck me about it is the thing that, um, in that brief experience with his story and prompted me to send that email to you, is just the amazing number of things that he accomplished in his career. And I love that you guys broke your book up into mm -hmm. acts. Mm -hmm. That there are actually probably several books here. I mean, it's almost like, uh, like you said, I mean, you, I was thinking Zelig, or, uh, the movie Zelig, just that somebody who was just seemed to be in the middle of everything. You broke it down into acts. The runaway, the fighter, the pilot, the impresario, the spy, and the pioneer. Let's Take those one at a time and talk real quickly. And I think you have some slides too that might supplement the conversation. The runaway, he started out in Columbus, Georgia under very humble circumstances, correct? Yeah, he did. And I uh, sort of apologize if you swivel around once in a while, uh, we'll flip through these slides. But this is Gene's family. Um, in, in the second row toward the right, you'll see a very diminutive woman who is sitting between a couple of uh, African-American gentlemen, and, and that's Jean's mother. And she was a full-blood Creek Indian. 
and his his father, uh, who is known as Big Ox because he was six four and two fifty, is immediately to her left or on the right hand side of the picture, and. The family had ten children, uh, seven of whom survived beyond infancy, and they were from an extremely poor family in Columbus, Georgia. And Big Ox was a laborer down on the docks on the Chattahoochee River. Columbus is just across from Phoenix City, Alabama, for those of you who are familiar with the South. And um, that's how the family got started. But there were many troubles, and it was a racially tense time, and unfortunately, uh, Gene's dad got into an argument with one of his white bosses and ended up in a fist fight. And uh, Big Chief Ox uh, picked the guy up, raised him over his head, and threw him into a barge in the middle of the river. Well, <clears throat> that caused some trouble. And uh, literally that night, a group of uh, uh, white gentlemen got together and got to doing some drinking. And they decided they would go out to the Bullard house and uh, string this guy up. Now, fortunately, uh, he avoided that terrible eventuality by sitting behind his front door with a loaded shotgun. But it had a huge impression on Gene, and even as a young kid, I mean, he was literally at that point about eight or nine years old, he made up his mind that he was going to run away and go to a place called France. His father, who had come from Haitian French ancestry, um, his forebears had come to America as slaves to work plantations in the South. But his father had always told him that in France there is much less racial prejudice. So that's where Gene wanted to go. And sure enough, uh, at about the age of 12, he set out with a dollar and a half in his pocket and a ticket on the railroad to Atlanta and ran away from home, age 12. And he made it not just to Atlanta, right? Oh. <clears throat> he uh, worked around the South for a couple of years and became a very successful jockey, racing horses in a lot of the county races. Um, he worked in a barber shop. He became a brick maker. And he was starting to apprentice for a tailor for a short period of time. But kept moving, moving, moving. Eventually, he rode underneath the railway car all the way to Newport News. And he found a ship. And he rode under. Under. A railroad car. Correct. Under. Didn't want to pay the money to ride in. <clears throat> found his way to Newport News. Found a ship that looked big enough that it might be able to cross an ocean. Stowed away aboard this vessel, which was populated by a crew that was speaking another language. He thought it had to be French. Well, it turned out it was German. <laughs> And they were headed to Glasgow, Scotland, which is where he ended up. Three days out, of course, the crew discovered him because he had run out of food and desperately needed a place to go to the bathroom. But the crew kind of took him in, and they let him work his passage across the Atlantic, shoveling coal and doing chores in the galley. But there he was in Glasgow, and the adventure begins in Europe. And that's the basically the next chapter when he, so he became a prize fighter, correct? Yeah, he did. He, he, uh, he was working a bunch of different things just to make ends meet. He was working in minstrel shows, he was working in carnivals, he, whatever he could get to, to make some money. And uh, at some point he uh, came to a gymnasium that was training fighters and he got, was kind of captivated by it and he said, I'll do anything, you know, I'll, I'll sweep the floors, I'll mop this, I'll clean the buckets and everything. So the guy who ran the gym first gave him a job, and then Gene asked about, you know, can I practice a little bit? Well, who knew that he also had talent as a boxer? And so as he was training, and, and there were a number of boxers training there who were sort of part of a group, uh, the most famous being the former heavyweight champion Jack Johnson, 
uh, Gene started to learn how to box, and he became a welterweight, eventually a welterweight contender. Uh, and it was boxing that finally got him to the place he had started out for uh, earlier, which was to get to France. He, with the, the group went over to France and to fight uh, a series of fights in Paris. And, uh, and when they left to go back to England, that's when uh, Gene said, I'm staying. I've always wanted to be here. This is where I want to be. And he stayed in Paris and as a fighter, uh, working other jobs too in between bouts. And probably, you know, if the war had not intervened, he may well have become an international or a welterweight championship contender. He could have even fought for the crown at some point. Maybe come to the United States, back, found his way back to the United States to fight for the championship. But uh, World War One intervened, and uh, that's where we get to the next section of the book, which is called The Fighter. And you chose to actually open the book in the epilogue, in the skies over the Western Front in World War I. Um, why? Why was that the first thing you decided to talk about? That wasn't our original prologue, though, was it? No, no, no. It wasn't. no it really? Was, we switched it. Yeah, we did. What was the original prologue? Uh, the original prologue. That's a good question. <laughs> well, we were gonna we were gonna start off sort of chronologically, but we decided to uh, <clears throat> bend to the wishes of those who it was are, notes are on the marketing side, and you know you always want to start a book out with an exciting chapter. So you know there he is. Oh, he got shot. That, yeah, that's the original prologue yeah, was yeah. getting shot actually, as a spy. <clears throat> that, that was the original one too. Yes, that was good. Yeah. But, uh, you know, th there he was in, in France, in, in Paris, <clears throat> in 1914, and of course what happens? World War I breaks out. He says to himself, I have to help my new adopted country. So he runs down to the recruiting office and finds out two things. Number one, you're too young. He was still 18. In France, you had to be 19 in order to enlist. And number two, the only place you can enlist is in the French Foreign Legion, because that's the only French service that accepts foreigners. So he waited a few months, and in October of 1914, when he turned 19, off he goes, and you'll see in this picture here, uh, this is uh, Jean far to the right, uh, in his uniform of the 3rd Marching Regiment of the French Foreign Legion in 1915. Um, from October to December of 1914, he went through so-called training. Well, it wasn't very much training and it wasn't very long, but he was obviously very strong, able-bodied, and they immediately saw in him a machine gunner. So they gave him this big heavy machine gun and a crew of two, uh, one to help him load the gun and the other to run for more ammo. And off they went and he was in the trenches, literally, in January of 1915 and he went through some horrendous, horrendous experiences. <clears throat> One of which was at Verdun, and here's a contemporary set of photographs of Fort Du Almont at Verdun in 1915. The uh, top left photo shows the fort before the Germans started attacking it, and the bottom right picture shows what's left of the fort after literally one million shells fell on it in one day. <clears throat> Gene was in the trenches at Verdun and uh, was uh, seriously wounded, and you'll find out more about that in the book. But he recovered and went back into the trenches again, fought through until his entire regiment, 500 men, was reduced to 25. And at that point, he and the others were offered a chance to transfer into regular French units because they weren't going to put this regiment back together. So he transferred to the 170th Infantry, <clears throat> yeah, who, were, who, were known, who were known as the Swallows of Death. And Jean, when he had been boxing, was called the Black Sparrow, but now he was going to be the Black Swallow of Death. <laughs> so back into the trenches he went and uh, was wounded once again very seriously. Evacuated, the doctors told him, you're done, that's it, you can't go back in the trenches, you 
can't perform those duties that you used to perform. But Jean said, the war's not over. You know, I, I still have to help. <laughs> well, the only thing you could do is fly an airplane. And Jean said, oh, all right, well, I'll give that a try. So off to Paris he goes on a leave, and he meets up with some of his buddies, one of whom is a boxing promoter he's gotten to know very well. And the guy's quite wealthy. And he says, I'll bet you $2,000 cash that you can't make it. Gene took that on and said, I'll take that bet. And off he goes to flight school. And six months later, guess what? He came back and collected. He had become a pilot. And was that as groundbreaking as it seems? I mean, he was the first African-American pilot. Um, it sort of demonstrates that um, France did have a different, uh, a different take on, on race relations. Yeah, they, they uh, truly did. It, it, it made no difference to them. And there were actually many uh, African-Americans scattered throughout the French forces at that time. But, but Jean was very conscious of his uh, place in history. And if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I'd just like to read a, a paragraph that I, that I picked out. Now, this is um, September 8th of 1917. Jean climbs into the cockpit of his Spad 7. After all his training is over, this is his first combat flight. Anyone on their first aerial combat mission is decidedly nervous, excited, and terrified. Eugene Ballard was all three. In addition, he clearly understood his place in the annals of aviation. He knew without question that he was about to become the first African-American fighter pilot in history. He would later recall about that groundbreaking mission. Now this is Gene speaking from his autobiography. In three minutes or less, the order was given, parte, meaning go. The chocks were pulled away, and so we did and fast. I sincerely believe that there has never been a pilot aviator who did not have a funny feeling on his first combat patrol, and who wasn't really scared the first time that he faced the enemy in the air, or who was flying in formation to meet the enemy. I am not ashamed to admit these facts about myself. Why should I be? I'm not an angel. I am not a hero. Anyhow, I was determined to do all that was in my power to make good, as I knew that the eyes of the world were watching me as the first Negro military pilot in the world. I felt the same way Lindbergh felt when he was the first to fly from New York to Paris. I had to do or die, and I didn't want to die. <laughs> By World War II, being a pilot was sort of romantic. Was that true that early on in, in military aviation? I'll tell you how romantic it was. <laughs> they had the best scarves. <laughs> <laughs> and it was such a, a chivalrous time that although the parachute had been invented, none of these pilots packed a parachute because they felt that to jump out of an airplane was abandoning their post and they'd rather go down with the ship than use the parachute. And it was only until the military figured out that the cost of training pilots was a lot more than a parachute <laughs> did they make taking a parachute mandatory. And Ballard was a successful pilot. Yeah, he was, he was. He flew, uh, we figure, either 25 or 27 missions. Now this is September <coughs> 1917, going into 1918, so the war is beginning to come to a conclusion. And uh, we, we feel very strongly that he shot down two German planes, and those <coughs> adventures are chronicled in the book. And <laughs> it, the, the second plane he shot down uh, did him the favor of shooting him down. So it was kind of a tit for tat situation. Quid but pro quo. Quid pro quo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get me started. <laughs> so, um, in fact, Penny asked me when I came in today, she said, I know what you'd rather be. <laughs> I said, yeah, at the hearings. But I'd rather be. No, I'd rather be. <laughs> so he survived. The, the being shot down? Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, when, when they, 
he, he was he was actually initially shot by the plane that he was pursuing, but that wasn't what brought him down. He he dove way down between a couple of hills to avoid the attacking airplane, figuring that if he flew between these hills, maybe he could you know get away. But what he didn't know is that on the top of one of these hills was a German machine gun nest, and as he went by, they started shooting at him, and they hit his engine and it immediately blew, and he, he plowed into the mud, um, crawled out of the plane, and uh, they immediately started shooting at him with the machine gun. But he hid behind the plane, and uh, when it got dark, he heard voices coming at him, and he said, oh no, they're coming to get me. But it turned out to be a French crew that his commander had sent out looking for him, because he didn't come back, and they brought a truck with them, and they hooked up the airplane, and they pulled it out of the mud and drove it back to the base. And it was filled with 97 bullet holes. So here's a guy that has escaped death three times in war. And there's your book. You're done. That, that you've got a great book there. What a wonderful story. So that's the end of the book, I guess. Right? Uh, no, there's, there's another chapter. Just yet. So let's, let's talk about the impresario. Yeah, that's the next section of the book, and that's 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 a perfect example of the of what I said before of him having so many lives and so many occupations. When he when the war was over, when he came back to Paris, there wasn't a big demand for fighter pilots. He had to make find a way to make to make a living, and so he became he he did box again, but you know, he had been wounded a couple of times. He wasn't really in the greatest of shape. Uh, he learned how to play the drums. And he became a, a jazz musician. Uh, he worked in different, with different bands. He worked at different nightclubs. And he eventually uh, not only was a musician in these clubs, but started becoming like the manager of these clubs into the 1920s, which was the jazz age. Uh, we, you know, we refer to them as the jazz age and, and, and the roaring 20s in the United States. I think in France, the term they use was the crazy years. Something crazy like, years. Crazy years. Because people, especially a lot of expatriate Americans, were coming over to Paris, and they were there to party. You know, there was stock market was going great. There was everybody had money. Uh, you had people who were stage and screen stars coming over to Paris to, to have fun and to and mingle with each other. And 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 Gene Bullard had this personality that people just took to him. So they would come to the club, uh, at the club the, first the club that he was like a manager of. And then he eventually became the owner of a nightclub. But uh, so he'd be there drumming in the band, and then he'd be there serving as maitre d. He'd be serving as the manager of the club. Uh, in fact, and he started to become friendly, uh, become friends with a number of these expatriate Americans, a well-known uh, uh, patrons of the arts. Uh, you see some of them there. There's, there's uh, Langston, Langston Hughes, who's in the upper center. Uh, who became one of America's most famous poets was Gene's dishwasher at this club. <laughs> he hired his dishwasher. Uh, you have Gene himself there in the upper left. Uh, the lower left is the singer uh, Bricktop, Josephine Baker, uh, Louis Armstrong. Uh, Hemingway became a friend of his. In fact, if you any of you get get in the mood to reread *The Sun Also Rises*, there is a black jazz, uh, a dr jazz drummer that's based on Eugene Bullard. <laughs> Uh, uh, Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald were friends, uh, Cole Porter, uh, uh, Fred Astaire and his sister when they were there, uh, silent screen stars like Gloria Swanson, Fatty Arbuckle. And one of the most remarkable coincidences that we, when Phil and I came across this, we sort of double checking with each other, is this possible? Is the fellow in the upper right, who some of you will recognize right away, Dooley Wilson from Casablanca. And uh, when Gene became the owner of his own nightclub, uh, his, his house musician was Dooley Wilson. And, and then later on, as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, Gene became a, a, a sort of like a, a black Bogart, is what we call him, because he became the, the owner of this nightclub that helped to spy on Germans. And there was always all this international intrigue going on. And there he had Dooley Wilson as his piano player. And then five years later, he's in Hollywood, Dooley Wilson, playing the piano player at Bogart's club in the movie Casablanca. Yeah. Uh, so there's, a, there's an example, too, of Gene playing the drums. Uh, there in the lower left, he is there with the drums. And, and this is actually from a YouTube clip. You can mm -hmm. see it on YouTube. Find some of the stuff. Yeah. Playing, playing drums. 
Yeah, uh, Louis Armstrong, when he came over to start touring Europe, he and Bull, uh, Gene became very fast friends right away, uh, to the point where, uh, as time went on, including later on after, after the Second World War, uh, Gene, uh, you, there were records that Louis Armstrong cut in the studio with Gene Bullard on drums. You can, you can, get, you can hear these recordings, on, find them on YouTube. And he eventually became a manager and, and tour director for Louis Armstrong uh, after the war. So he, he just had a way of, of people gravitating to him. And he was so multi-talented. So like Joe, as, as the question began, yes, he, okay, the World War I is over. He's a much decorated officer. And he goes back to Paris to enjoy you know, the post-war uh, time. End of the book. But this whole new chapter, which we call the Empresario, opens up where he is one of the most becomes one of the most famous uh, entertainers and nightclub empresarios in the city of Paris when everybody was coming to Paris to party. So that's a bonus. You have another thing to talk about. Now there's your book, right? Plus, let's so, stop World, right there. so World War II rolls around and nothing happens, right? But there's more. But there's more. <laughs> so what what did you do during World War II? Well. Uh, we think it was probably late 1938, and certainly by early 1939. Um, you can well imagine that the uh, Germans, the rise of the Nazi movement, many hundreds, thousands of Germans were infiltrating France, and many of them were visiting in Paris. And uh, among the German crowd, uh, Jean's Club, which was called uh, La Escadrille, and there's a photo in the lower right-hand side of the inside of his club. Uh, La Escadrille means the squadron, obviously, from his World War I experiences. But it became one of the most popular clubs in Paris among the German crowd. So one day, a, uh, an inspector of uh, French police shows up at uh, Jean's Club. And he said, could I have a conversation with you? And Jean said, sure. And the guy takes him aside and he said, well, now look, we, we know a lot of Germans are coming to your club. And in addition to being an inspector for the French police, I'm a member of the Deuxième Bureau, which ultimately became the French resistance after the war started. And the Deuxième Bureau at the time was responsible for internal uh, spying, which much like uh, the FBI would be here in, in America. And he said, uh, we'd like you to, uh, you know, kind of listen in, and if you hear anything interesting among your German patrons, maybe you could uh, give, us a, give us a call or give us a report. And Gene, who, uh, who obviously had fought the Germans in World War I, uh, had very strong feelings against the Nazis, said, I'll do it, but you have to you have to do me one favor. And the one favor was, if something happens to me, you have to take care of my two daughters. By this time, Jean had had two uh, young girls. And that's another story. <laughs> anyway. Um, we have to leave them something to read in the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a good one. Um, so Jean said, yeah, sure. And uh, <laughs> the resistance gave him a partner to work with, are you ready for this? Her name was Cleopatra. <laughs> she went by Kitty, and her last name was Terrier. Cleopatra Terrier. She was young, beautiful, from Alsace-Lorraine. Unfortunately, her family had been murdered by, by the Germans in World War I, so she was very much into uh, helping the French. So she and Jean, you know, talked up the Germans and, and plied them with champagne, and Jean kept pouring the champagne, pretending he didn't speak a word of German, he spoke it fluently. Jean and Kitty were the first to pick up information from German officers in that club that the Germans were going to invade Poland. And they sent that information immediately up the line to their superiors, which their superiors immediately ignored. <laughs> but <clears throat> their, their uh, spying at the club was very successful, except for, oh, you tell them about the one time Gene really got in trouble. Well, he did. Uh, Gene was at his club uh, in the early hours of the club, and a, a man who was actually a regular patron there, uh, a Sicilian, um, he had gotten the idea, he, he had been observing how Gene 
was so informally familiar with the German officers. And, and again, just to put a PS to something Phil said, uh, it was beyond the comprehension of these Nazi officers that a black man could have any, any understanding of another language, or could understand what they were saying. He, they looked at him as nothing, even though he owned the club, as nothing more than a servant, just somebody pouring their champagne. So, uh, so Gene was gathering a lot of this information, as Phil said, because they were, they were having these unguarded conversations, because um, you know, Gene was beneath consideration for these Nazi officers. Uh, but this, this, this Sicilian Cor or Corsican, was it Corsican? Corsican, Corsican yeah. yeah, Corsican, had noticed this, and he was part of the, what seemed to be a gangster element there, who would previously be on friendly relationships with Gene, but he got it into his head that Gene must be a spy for the Germans, because he's so friendly with them. And one night, he basically burst into the club and said, uh, you know, goodbye, Bullard, this is your last day on Earth, and he shot him. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, it, it was interesting, we, we described, the, the, there was a, quite the fight that involved <laughs> Bullard having to crack him over the head with a champagne bottle. Uh, but he was, he was uh, rushed to the hospital, you know, Kitty, who seemed to be everywhere, appeared, put him in a taxi, brought him to the hospital, and he basically said, you know, you don't have any, you're not going to survive. You don't have a chance. So he summons the inspector of the, from the French resistance and who shows up and says, now you're going to have to keep your promise, take care of my daughters because I won't be able to, I'll be dead. And end of the book, right? Mm. <laughs> well, there's more. <laughs> uh, there's more where uh, he does recover. Uh, eventually what happens is that the Germans, of course, invade France. Uh, World War II gets into full swing. And, and Jean um, uh, has, to, has to flee Paris because if he's, if he's caught, he'll be immediately executed because of his work with the French resistance. He rejoins the French military and actually ends up back in his own regiment, I think. The same regiment. Well, he went, he, uh, went searching for his uh, regiment and... Um, and he's in his 40s by now. He's 44. Yeah. Um, and he finds out after leaving Paris on foot with a backpack. Uh, that his regiment's already been wiped out. So he tries to get back into Paris, the city is sealed. Then he takes another hike down south because he heard another unit was still fighting the French in the city of Orléans. And he finds the unit, and lo and behold, the commander of the unit was his lieutenant in his unit in World War I. So the major says, I'm so glad to see you, Sergeant. Here's a machine gun. Go at it. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Yeah. Here's my machine gun. I don't want to uh, short shrift his last act, uh, but, but I know time is going to come into play here. But he was also a pioneer and, and a civil rights figure, correct? He was. He, uh, you know, he, we, we can't go into too much detail now about his, the rest of World War II, his, the way he got to the United States. Uh, he was reunited with his daughters. Uh, Kitty had sort of taken care of them until she could smuggle them out of France and eventually ended up in the United States. Uh, Jean raised his daughters there. He had an apartment in Spanish Harlem. He worked a whole bunch of jobs, including for Louis Armstrong, who hired him when he needed a job. And, uh, but one of, the, one of my favorite parts of the entire book uh, takes place in 1949 uh, when there's a, 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 a concert being held in Peekskill, New York, by Paul Robeson. Now, Paul Robeson was a divisive figure at that time because he was a great artist, musical artist, actor. Uh, he had done plays by Eugene O'Neill. He had done the movie Showboat. He had, and, but he was also politically involved, and some some people linked him with the Communist Party, so that he was seen as anti-American. And certainly, anybody who was uh, very much white nationalists, uh, Klan members, anything along those lines, uh, Paul Robeson was somebody to target. And so there was this concert that was being held in Peekskill, New York, and, and Jean Bullard was part of a, a large group of African Americans from New York City who took buses up to the concert to go see it. And they were getting off the bus and they were being harassed and attacked by not only just white nationalists and groups of those, but, and, and, but even, even police officers, state troopers and, and others who were there to prevent this concert from taking place. And the idea was, if you could stop people from entering the arena where the concert was, there would be no concert. There was no audience, there was no reason to have a performance. So that was the idea, stop these people in their tracks. And Bullard, you know, gets off the bus, he starts making his way toward the entrance, and we have 
there's some photos. He's attacked by the police and he's beaten so severely to the ground by sticks and nightclubs and, 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 and clubs and stuff like that. Uh, he would eventually lose the sight in his left eye. But he stay, gets back up and he walks into that arena and people follow him in there and the concert is held. So he became inadvertently a very early, this 1949 civil rights pioneer who would not, even the beatings would not keep him on the ground. He got back up and led the crowd into the arena. And, okay, end of the book, right? <laughs> well, there's more, but we can't tell you too much more. Go ahead. It just, it, what an amazing human being. I mean, what an amazing man he was. What do you take away from, from the experience of, you, you had some trouble getting the information for this book, correct? I mean, it was it was difficult to, to track down a lot of information. Yeah, it was a it was genuine, genuinely a research a challenge because so many of the records of uh, families in the South when when Gene was a young man simply weren't uh, written down. Uh, but fortunately, um, I did discover that there was one archive at Columbus State University in Gene's hometown of Columbus, Georgia. Columbus State is part of the University of Georgia system. So I, I went down there and spent the week and I was pawing through cardboard box after box, pulling out notes and photos and stringing the stuff together. Uh, Gene also wrote his own autobiography at the very end of his life, and it was, it, it, it was entitled All Blood Runs Red, which is why we used the title to, to honor him. But he wrote it out longhand in French on, on yellow pads. So, you know, but, but he had someone translate it for him. And, and believe it or not, uh, she was at the time uh, quite a well known author in her own right, especially uh, with magazines. And she took it around to all the major publishers in New York, and they all read it and said, wow, this is terrific. It's wonderful. It's unbelievable. We can't publish it. Nobody would believe it. By the way, one little footnote, I, you, you may find this interesting. All Blood Runs Red it is, is what Gene painted on the side of his airplane. So you get the symbolism, right? No matter if you're black, white, yellow, brown, you know, you, you fight for your country, you get hurt, you bleed, everybody bleeds red. All Blood Runs Red, that's, that's where it came from. And just very quickly, because there's a slide up there that we should probably just explain very quickly what it is. Uh, in, his, in his last years, in order to provide for his daughter still and, 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 and pay his own rent and everything, uh, Gene found a job as an elevator operator at Rockefeller Center. <laughs> and he would wear the elevator operator's uniform every day, and he would also every day choose from, he, he'd, over his career in, in the military, he had received something like 15 medals including the highest medal France could give, the Croix de Guerre, which I guess is sort of like the equivalent of our Medal of Honor. And so one day Dave Garraway, who was the man on the left, who was the host of the Today Show, which was taped at Rockefeller Center, got into the elevator with Gene, and they knew each other, were chatting, he said, what's, what's that medal on there? And then Gene started to tell his story, and Garraway was flummoxed, and invited Gene on his show, and that's, this is an actual still, from Eugene Ballard, late in his life, wearing his elevator operator's uniform, and there's Garraway showing off his collection of medals. <laughs> they interviewed him for 15 minutes on a national the, the Today Show, and that was his fit, literally his 15 minutes of fame in America before he sank into obscurity uh, until, well, we had the good fortune to come along and get the opportunity to write a book about him. Amazing stuff. I want to give people a chance to ask questions if you have any. Anybody have any questions? Can you just finish telling us about his life, though? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, you have, to, you have to read the book. I didn't. I don't want to ruin the book for everyone. Okay, That's okay. over there in the corner. <laughs> okay. Yes. Pile of books. <laughs> you question right here. Uh, how many languages did he know? Uh, obviously French. Right? Yeah. Well, to our knowledge, I think there was four: English, French, German, and Italian. Wow. He probably could speak uh, passingly a couple of Spanish and. You know, especially at, later in his life when he lived in Spanish Harlem, but that's another one of his amazing talents. He was a linguist. You know, he could pick things up. He didn't study yeah. German. You know, he just learned how to learn how to do it. Yeah, he. There was a slide early on. Uh, uh, he, he basically ran away from home with what amounted to a second grade education. Um, but fortunately, he, he was a very bright kid, 
and uh, you can tell from his many adventures. Yes, sir. Did he stay connected to his family and home in Georgia? Good question. Well, that's a good question. Unfortunately, uh, no. Um, we tried very hard to track down all of his immediate family members, and uh, we could only find a couple of them. He did re when he came back to America. He did reconnect with uh, one of his sisters who lived in Virginia at the time, but he didn't spend much time with her. He came back to America, went to Columbus, Georgia once, found out his brother Hector had been lynched in a dispute of over a peach orchard of all things. And uh, when he got back to his hometown of Columbus, nobody wanted to hear from him for nothing. They didn't care whether he was a hero, didn't care whether he fought for France. All they could see was that he was black, and that was it. He never went back. Um, his, his, um, his two daughters um, each had one child, a girl, and a boy. The young man grew up to uh, join the U.S. Air Force and retired as a Master Sergeant. And we tried to track him down, but after he retired, he moved to California, then moved to Canada. And we, we think he may be still up there doing something, but he doesn't want to be found. Yes, sir. Over here, had a question? Yes. Um, how did you write the book? Did each, each one of you take a chapter? Did you split the chapters up? Filled it all the work. I wrote my name at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I, rec I recommend if you want to be a co-author, that's, that's how you start. Uh, no, uh, you know, we've each collaborated with other people, and, and certainly my experience is that you can't have four hands on the keyboard. Uh, so uh, Phil did a very extensive first draft, and then I got involved in revising, and then it was a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, you know, the, most, the very important thing is to sound like one voice. You know, not confuse the reader because you can tell really if one person writes one chapter and one writes the other. No matter how homogenous you try to be, uh, there's just every person has their own voice. Every writer has their own voice. So, so that's 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 how we did it. You you, you really there, there's different ways to do it. In this particular case, that's how we we did it. How long was the process? Well, gosh, I have I have an email, probably your email, to 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 me and to Phil. I think was is dated like the the latter part of 2015. So really, it was it was several years of, of work to get to, to get this book together. This we we didn't. Um, uh, you'd think in this age of uh, the internet and, and speed and so on and so forth that books could be produced a little bit faster than they than the Gutenberg Bible, but uh, it's not really true. Um, and, and there's some good reasons for that. I think we. We probably finished the draft maybe 18 months after we started. But, but then it was another year to get the book published because you've got to line up copy editors, you've got to uh, line up the sales force, you know, they have to figure out where they're going to sell the book, you have to you know, get an index going, there's so many details that go with it. It, it really does take, you know, if, if we turn in a finished manuscript that everybody likes, it takes about a year for that to appear as this. How old was Gene when he died? He died, uh, he was born in October 1895. He died in October of 1961, so he had just passed his 66th birthday when he died. Wow. Yeah. And when you consider the wear and tear and all the adventures yeah. he had, the times he got wounded, yeah. that he made it to 66 is quite remarkable. Over here. Uh, have you found the movie right yet? <laughs> yeah. You see this uh, poster behind me? Um, that's the first draft of the movie poster. When, that was done by my son. He was a senior at West Hampton Beach High School. And now the executive producer, I'm told. <laughs> so all we need to do is fill in the names uh, on the bottom. But uh, I am very happy to be able to tell you we have signed a deal. And we um, get file cut. Um, we're not quite sure yet. We, we can we can only tell you that it's with uh, a company that's run by Lena Waithe. Some of you may know her. She's an Emmy Award-winning actress and producer.
She has a new movie coming out right about now called Queen and Slim. You may have seen some of the ads on TV. She has a production company, and uh, our agent has uh, worked out a deal with the uh, production company. Um, she wants it to be a uh, major motion picture. I appreciate your asking that because I didn't know if I was allowed to ask the question, so I didn't. So I'm glad you did. We got that out in the open. That's good stuff. Yes? Did you have to travel much for your research, or was most of it, of course, done? He wouldn't send me to France. <laughs> he said it would cost him too much. Yeah, yeah. No, well, well, Phil got to uh, uh, the, the great privilege of going to Columbus, Georgia. Uh, yeah, really, you know, sometimes when you work on a book and there's multiple research sources, you do have to travel. But in this case, there was no other repository of Eugene Bullet information than where Phil went, which is Columbus, Georgia. You know, um, you can do so much with the internet today that you couldn't do even 10 years ago, so it makes an author's life much easier. But uh, we still had to, you know, paw through, a ton, a ton, this is what Tom's good at, tons of, you know, magazine articles from 1936. And we got into divorce records from the 16th arrondissement in Paris, and, and you know, on and on. But uh, I would say that uh, probably the books that were available were very few, really just one in particular. However, we could, and this is what made it easier, uh, we could cross-reference Gene from many other stories. You know, Tom mentioned Hemingway, so you know, there's one data point. He mentioned Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, there's another data point. So we, we looked at all of their biographies and their stories and found out much more about, about Gene. I'm gonna ask you, um, you mentioned in the book that there were many anecdotes that were some of them from uh, Gene's memoir that you didn't include in the book because they couldn't be corroborated, um, but some of them were really good. So this is like the editor's cut of the book. So what's one of those that you didn't include in the book that's a terrific little anecdote? Well, one thing that we found uh, in, in Gene's uh, unpublished uh, memoir uh, he talks about the death of his wife and the mother of his children in the 1930s and how it came that he had to raise his daughters himself as a, as a, as a widower. Uh, she died in the 1990s, his wife. Uh, so he killed her off in the 30s. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it was discovered uh, with that, that she actually had lived on for decades to be a Ritz, may not even have known that her daughter, her, her husband, and her daughters had survived World War II. Uh, so there's an example of where we had to very carefully fact check so much of not only of the things we were finding out elsewhere, but especially Gene's own memoir, because, <laughs> you know, and we, we had the feeling that, uh, you know, and, and Joe being editor of a newspaper knows that, that uh, if, if in an article, for example, if, if somebody discovers there's something wrong, they tend to think, oh, the whole thing must be bogus. The whole thing is inaccurate. So we felt that way. We very much took that journalism approach to this book. We have to make sure that there's no inaccuracies in it. Because if somebody finds one in chapter two, they're going to think that the whole book is is, is shaky. And, and to be fair to Gene, um, you know, the guy is uh, literally dying of cancer, trying to finish his book, and it's been you know 50 years plus for some of these memories, and they weren't quite so clear to him. But uh, we used a process that we like to call triangulation. You know, if there's one data point. We want to try to cross it with, oops, sorry, two more. Destruction. So um, that's what we tried to do. One last question. Yeah, do you anticipate or would be surprised that the family contact you, that the kids, <laughs> mm -hmm. after maybe a movie and now that the book out, that they have come forward? It's interesting you say that because it's already happened. Oh, it, well, sort of minimally. Uh, we did not know this, but three weeks ago, maybe a month, a statue to Gene Ballard was dedicated at uh, an Air Force base in Georgia, which we knew nothing about. But apparently, um, the family of his brother, who I told you that was lynched, 
um, has been doing some digging on that side of the family, not Gene, but his brother Hector and, and his other siblings, and they found out, coincidentally, about Gene's history, and they were instrumental in raising some money to have this statue to him um, put uh, in, in uh, this, uh, or on this Air Force base. So we think we're probably going to get some contact between the other side. Unfortunately, his daughters have passed away. We don't know about the two grandchildren. We couldn't find them. But we also didn't want a Henrietta Lacks situation, you know, where you write a book and all of a sudden all the relatives come out of the woodwork and say, where's my gut? Um, we don't think that's, that's going to happen. Just one very quick tiny PS. Uh, posthumously, uh, Eugene Bullard uh, was commissioned as a lieutenant in the United States Air Force. So it, took, it didn't happen during his lifetime, but at a ceremony years after his death, which his daughters attended, and his master sergeant grandson, uh, he became a Lieutenant Eugene Bullard, USAF. In this uh, photo you see, this is the last one, he is a, a bust of Gene Bullard, obviously in his World War I gear at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And there's a beautiful, uh, large exhibit on Gene and his uniform and his background and his many medals at the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, if you ever get out that way. I, I got to tell you, I have such, such a, um, a connection to this book for so many different reasons, you guys being a big, big part of it, but I also just love a good story and I love a good story that's well told, which you guys definitely did, and it's a story that should have been told for so long, and I just really appreciate you guys doing that. Thank you for writing the book, thank you for being here today. Yeah, well, the bad news is there are only two more books because a lot of very clever people already went and got their copies. Thank you all for being here, and may I say in the presence of witnesses, well, we'll be very hopeful that we will get to screen this movie as soon as it comes out. So, thank you. Thank the three of you very much.